We're all on. We're rolling. Welcome to our show. Profe, Jaime Ramirez. Thanks for joining us. It's good to be here, Chris. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean, people are extremely excited, obviously, that the Fuego's back. There was a huge reception. One of our most liked posts, most interactive posts is when, when you were announced as, as the director deportivo or sporting director of a club. And, you know, uh, just an incredible amount of response from the community and, and an outpouring of, of love and support because of because of you. Um, what what does that mean to you? And, and what are your thoughts on, you know, taking on this role with the club? Well, I'm really thankful. Uh, for the acknowledgement by the community and and certainly many of them were there from the very beginning in 2002 2003 when we started and we began this journey um, that uh, you know has taken us to some significant heights here in the the valley and as far as football uh, soccer is concerned and so uh, it it means a lot and it means a lot that they responded it means a lot that their friends that uh, uh, texted me, emailed me with affirmation um, about uh, this new this new experience. That that it it, it although it is new, it is uh, it's sort of a chapter two. Sure. If if you want to if you want to call it that, um, to what we already did once, mm-hmm. and taking it to the next level professionally, that means a lot to me. It means a lot to my family. It means a lot to all of those players generations of players that we've had um, um, throughout the, the history of, of Fuego in the past all those fans that have supported us the, the diehard fans that, uh, that you know every game they're out there supporting our supporter groups you know that formed out of uh, really uh, out of uh, two guys mm-hmm. you know um, that uh, had La Bombardera you right. know and yeah, when, those started, yeah. when those guys started that uh, w- when Fuego was playing at the uh, um, at San Joaquin Memorial at Fresno Pacific, at um, you know in Visalia when we were at uh, I can't think of the name of the high school right now, but we're we're, we're in Visalia, and um, and they moved over to Central uh, Central West, um, and and you know all the places that we've been that led the team to uh, Chukchansi Park and there I mean it just just went to another level. So right. re- really excited and thankful for uh, for the opportunity. So yeah, definitely. I mean I think. You know, from the club's perspective, it was, uh, you know, Jaime Ramirez was the number one target from day one. I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people around that that know soccer in this community, but there, there's not many people out there that have had the type of impact that you've had on on young men and women uh, across the valley at the level that that you have and the amount of respect that you have. What what this podcast is um, is designed to do is to be more. Uh, a, more than just about soccer it's about the people and it's about the community but i think you know the first couple of of episodes is is more about um you know maybe marketing or or strategy or interactions that we have with with community members but i think people are really excited to hear about soccer and they're really excited to hear about what's the team going to look like um what are your strategies in in building out a roster and and what's the team going to look like on the pitch yeah, um, thanks for asking. And, and I just remember it was Golden West, the high Golden school West, in Visalia, okay. and a yeah. shout out to uh, Coach John McCaw, you know, okay. former Sunbird himself. There you go. Uh, you know, they opened the doors for us to you know to do that uh, over there that, that one season. But uh, you know, um, I, I just think that uh, you know we've talked about it uh, extensively. We've uh, met with uh, local coaches here in the community. You know, we've had uh, meetings already, as you very mm-hmm. well know. Um, and I think we all have agreed that uh, it has to have what Fuego um, originally did and did for a number of years, and that's to have the local flavor. Mm. That's to have uh, a roster that represents the Central Valley and the players that come up through the various uh, programs that, uh, that are offered here, whether it's youth, whether it's high school, whether it's uh, colleges, universities, et cetera. And and sprinkle the <clears throat> a handful of guys that come from from other areas because we're going we are going to recruit we have to go out and find players that are going to come in and be and uh, and be professionals and represent the team you know USL one um, is a level of competition that I believe can be very very high and even though we've experienced championship you know second division soccer we believe we can match that and possibly even be better. 
um, with local talent and, like I said, sprinkles of, of other, uh, other players from, from wherever they, they may come. We have uh, doors that are open to us to recruit you know, from outside. Um, however, just sitting down with uh, local coaches in the area and coming up with the lists of players that are from here, uh, we have enough to put together a, a solid team. And so that is going to be the, the flavor as far as uh, uh, I'm concerned and the makeup to give priority to those, uh, to those kids. And, and so that if, if they're listening, those of those them that are listening out there, uh, I suggest that they, they prepare themselves. Because uh, we all know that uh, you know COVID has affected all of us, and and is affected in a way that uh, you know some kids are not preparing themselves; they're doing other things, and 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 rightly so, correct? But there's opportunities to go out and uh, uh, and take care of yourself as a young athlete, as a young professional, that you can do things daily, that you can manage yourself, um, and. Uh, um, do the things that are required for recovery and things like that. But once once we open the doors to tryouts, we want to look locally. So be prepared if you're out there and your intent um, is to to come out and, and join the program and try out um, and all that. You know, style uh, style. You know, I'm I'm a very offensive pl uh, player myself. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and as a coach, um, in fact, I, I remind my teams at, at Fresno Pacific that when you look at his, that you scored the most goals no. and one. No, <laughs> no, no, not, not about myself, no, about, no, about my team, about my team. Yeah. No, you know what? In fact, uh, you well, scored quite a few, yeah, right? I scored quite a few, yeah. and and one of the, and one of the things that I'm proudest, I guess, I, I could say, and, and I'm not, I'm not selfish that way. I don't think I am. I mean, I was glad that I held the scoring record at Fresno Pacific for 20 years. 20 years. Wow. And then uh, I recruited a kid from my hometown that came, and and uh, actually the the. Um, the, the career scoring record, the single season scoring record was um, uh, I had 20 Augie Colmanero. Um, a shout out to my to my buddy uh, from uh, from the Roosevelt uh, High School uh, area there. And uh, they had also scored 20 goals. So him and I, you know, were, were tied for 20 for all that uh, that time. Uh, uh, well, actually, until the mid 80s, when Rafael, Rafael De Sico from uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil came and he scored 21 goals mm -hmm. and he scored the last goal on the national championship match. Wow. Uh, you know to break uh, to break the record and so however the 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 career record was Edgardo Contreras uh, mm -hmm. he came in and broke that you know it lasted for 20 years and in, in what I'm really excited about and proud of every time I look at our records uh, on on our web page is the guys that have come after me that have broken uh, the the records whether it's single season whether it's career whether it's assists whether it's points whether it's um, those guys have all been under us, mm -hmm. you know, whether I was an assistant or a head coach, and yeah. we've been able to influence that. And we've been able to, for, uh, be, been fortunate enough to recruit fantastic, fantastic players. And so th that, that's exciting to me. And so, uh, and so since, since then, because I understand the nuances of finishing, I understand the nuances of playing attacking football, um, I feel like my teams have been... Uh, um, characterized by being very offensive and, and trying to outscore our opponents. And, and that's not to say that we don't uh, train and we don't line up ourselves defensively well. Um, however, um, when you look at some of our most successful teams, you know, we play with a 3-5-2 or 3-2-3-2 three, two, three, three, two, um, or a 1-4-3-3. Three, three. You know, mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. for the last uh, you know, decade or so, we've been playing that system. Mm -hmm. that is so popular around the world and so we like and wh to go and why, why do you think why do you think that is because i feel like a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of our listeners out there are watching you know they're watching the epl they're watching bundesliga they're watching la liga and, and 433 has become extremely popular uh worldwide why why do you think that that style is is working so well worldwide and, and why does it work well for you well i think that the dutch proved that it was the most balanced system in terms of attacking and defending uh, when you look at the the back four and when you look at the front six, three, three, so you're attacking with six and then mm -hmm. you're incorporating your uh, outside backs into the attack. So sometimes you can attack with seven. Mm -hmm. And then when you drop on defense, you drop your uh, two wingers down and you're now in a four, five, mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. defensive posture. And so uh, I think it's a, it, it, it might be easier for a lot of us coaches to sell that when you have kids that want to attack. 
mm -hmm. with the score goals. Because mm -hmm. you get more attacking positions you, on the field. You get a lot more yeah. attacking positions, and you make it a little more difficult on the defenses to mm -hmm. um, to defend three strikers, an attacking midfielder, um, outside wing backs coming up, than just your typical two striker formation right. or the one with a four five one. Yeah. And so you're asking in a four in a four five one, you're asking midfielders to be attackers mm -hmm. and defenders and oftentimes that's a lot that's a lot of running yeah and so when you have uh wingers that are more speedy they're more offensive and yes you have to teach them defensive skills sure <laughs> that's that's a struggle sometimes that, that, right? that is a struggle yeah. that, that is a struggle sometimes but uh you know when you make it very clear to them that it is critical and crucial to the success of the team for them to be able to do that um it works in fact uh, right case in point my current team right now we're uh you know we have uh, a, a, sh uh, a couple of shifts of players that come in come in and out of starters you know start the game and they do a fantastic job they'll get us a goal or two and then we get that second group to come in and possibly get one but but to maintain that balance of offensive and defensive uh, posture is uh, is critical and they do that with in something I'd seen is is a lot of a lot of coaches and a lot of the style at least that I've seen in the USL a lot of teams go four four two, but they really push those outside backs up and so when you play against the three man front, sometimes you can keep those outside backs from being able to attack as much because they're having to defend those those wingers so it puts them in a seemingly a more defensive position because if they leave their space. There's Correct. wingers ready to go. Correct. I think the tendency for a four-four-two system is for your outside backs to sit. Mm. They just sit. They, they don't. Go, they don't go unless you train to have your midfielders push up and create space and then pinch in. And then now you're asking him to rotate um, in, in in different ways that that, that uh, I think you can exploit that. Uh, uh, when they get out of uh, out of system, out of formation, you, mm -hmm. you can exploit that if you if you're the other team. So, we we have uh, a, as a team that runs a one four three three, we have relative success with teams that play a four four two against us or a four two three one. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Very interesting. So what what kind of uh, what kind of players do you en envision fitting into the system that you're looking for as far as your way of recruitment or your way of you know building this team of local players? Um, what type of players are you looking to fit into that system? Well, um, for me, I think that I want every player, I want every player to be a good footballer, mm -hmm. just to be a good soccer player. And, and that's what I try to instill in youth coaches, you know, since I've been uh, working with several clubs here in the area, is that uh, first and foremost, make good soccer players out of kids. Mm -hmm. Then whatever position they end up as, um, uh, older adolescents, young adults, you know, it, it'll be up to their coach to, to make those decisions, but, but the very beginning. So when we start putting kids, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds into positional play, even goalkeepers, if you will, um, and, and just say, this is the position you're going to play, um, I think we're, we're giving them a message that it's difficult sometimes to get them out of that mentality. And so, um, so m my point being is that I recruit I try to recruit good, solid soccer players. I may recruit a kid that's a 10 for his high school team or for his community college team, and he's going to play right back for me because I know he handles the ball really well, because I know he's confident under pressure, because I know we can uh, get him to, to push forward on the, on the outside. Um, and, and I've done that in the past, um, and it's been very successful when you see um, a, a right uh, back who was a 10 all his life and all of a sudden you know, he just goes forward and defenders don't know what to do with him because they got to take care of the winger and all of a sudden this guy's making a 45 50 yard run with the ball um and same thing on the, on the left and so we're we're, we're we're recruiting players that are good good footballers obviously there's some in in some positions there are some physical characteristics sure. right when yeah. you're looking at your center backs you want to mm -hmm. get guys that uh they have good stature because at the professional level you have uh, balls being dumped into the area left and right. You want a goalkeeper that's got good, uh, you know, good height or good uh, timing and awareness. You know, he doesn't have to be a six four guy, mm -hmm. um, but you know, if he's a five eleven uh, and you know he knows uh, his area and he knows he's got timing, he's got good hops. Um, you know, he, he's he's gonna do well. Um, he's got great ath athleticism, etc. You know, I mean, we look at. Uh, 
one of the founders of uh, of Fuego, you know, Cisco Alvarez. Uh, I think Cisco was uh, six, uh, five, uh, five, eleven, six foot with his cleats on. I would mm -hmm. say Li listed at six <laughs> exactly. two on his oh. on his card. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but man, he had some hops. I mean, the, the, the guy he made the most spectacular save that I've ever seen any goalkeeper wow. at live level for me uh, in a scrimmage at Fresno State against. Uh, I think it was Sacramento State we were scrimmaging. Um, he went from just the, the middle of the of the box to the upper V corner on, on just one step. Wow. And and so having having that, right? Having that athleticism, having that ability, um, it's important. Um, and, it, and it's not easy, it's not easy to find, you know. So we have to be very selective and you know, we're encouraging uh, uh, young kids that are out there, you know, training right now and preparing themselves, young adolescents, you know, to to really work on uh, all of the aspects of agility, balance, coordination, and then the skill aspect of it, right? To be ready and prepared to uh, to compete at a, at a professional level. So yeah, so so we're, we're looking for those characteristics. Obviously, you know, with the with the three midfield formation, we're looking at uh, you know the six and an eight, a six that wins balls all the time, and and it's no nonsense. He's going to tackle no matter what, and you know maybe draw a few yellow cards through throughout <laughs> the season, but. Uh, they're right. well worth it, and so and, and and that's why we have subs, right? We don't have one; we we have two of those guys. You're right. Yeah. You know, and then we have an eight that can do, you know, both. They can attack and, and defend a little bit, and then we want the ten. I, I'm I'm sold on the idea that uh, you have to have a playmaker. Um, uh, at times, I'm I'm hearing that uh, some some people have asked me, well, why don't you get the, just three midfielders to rotate in a circular motion that all of them can play those roles? Is, uh, I I don't I don't care for that because mm. I think uh, then you're uh, you, you're you sort of uh, watering down the the skills and ability and the function of that particular position and the role. So I want a ten that can create, that can score goals. Mm -hmm. um, you look at our last uh, great ten that we had at Fresno Pacific, Anthony Velarde. Yeah. You know, for me to ask Anthony to be a six or an eight, it wasn't going to happen. And that's why he's playing professionally for the Riverhounds because that's what that's what the coach of the Riverhounds uh, loved about him that he didn't have a player like him with the attacking tendencies that Anthony has. And, you know, to top it off, he's a lefty. And so, mm. so we want that. And, and certainly on a nine, we want, we want a banger. We're gonna, uh, we want a guy up there that's going to be able to post up and bring balls down and lay him off uh, and also be an area player, you know, be able to score on, on the first touch. Mm -hmm. um, You've had a lot of players come through FPU at the nine position that maybe not are your typical 6'1", 6'2", 6'3", guys, but they've been, you know, um, they've been creative. Like, what uh, do you, do you feel like? You know, you see the Sergio Agueros out there that may not be the the biggest guys. How do you, how do some of those players? Uh, and a lot of those guys are coming up in this area that may not have a t you know a ton of size. How are they effective in that nine role as as not a big guy? Well, I, I think that the effectiveness effectiveness comes out of recognizing that they're not a true nine; they're a false nine. And so for us to tuck that player in between lines and feed him the ball because uh, a smaller player on the, in the nine position is going to be a little bit craftier mm. than, a, than a taller player. At least that's been the tendency, right? It's mm -hmm. not to say that the taller players aren't crafty. Um, they just move a little bit different, right? Right. And you, you, when you use a, a guy like Sergio Aguero and, and the times when Messi has been used as a false nine too, I mean, who can argue with that sure. decision, right? Yep. And so... Um, so we, we've, we've done the same thing, and this is, you very well know, uh, uh, a Fuego player that currently plays for me is, uh, is um, Felipe Sousa, and there's been times when Felipe has played in the false nine position because mm -hmm. he's not a true nine. I can't expect him to play, uh, you know, body up on those you know, tall defenders, you know, so he drops in, in, into that gap and gets the ball and goes at, uh, at people. And so, yeah, I mean, th that's definitely um, a variable. Right. right to choose you know, to bring in a strong target nine player and then have that um that false nine player and then whoever wins the spot wins the spot right it's, sure. it's a nice yeah. problem to have if uh, we're able to uh, to get that yeah so you talk a lot about you know about local players and that's been a huge focus of the club from the inception um you know 20 years ago but it but it's not always just like there's this huge crop to to select from there's something before that, right? There's development. And so part of your role with the Fuego will be creating the development model for the next generation of, of Fuego players. What What's your strategy there to help with the development of the future pros that are coming out of the Central Valley? Well, I think with our USL2 program that we're going to have, uh, formerly PDL, mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to give us a, a platform to be able to groom players 
in looking at that under 23 age category, the college, local college players, and perhaps players from other colleges that might want to come and, and join the PDL, but obviously giving our local players the priority and looking at them to make sure that they're prepared and ready to compete at that level. And then directly myself and my staff working with the, with the USL2 staff uh, in terms of what we want to see uh, uh, as far as player development and how we want to project players to, uh, to sign professional contracts. Um, I think that's, uh, that's part of my plan and you know we've begun those discussions already with a handful of coaches uh, from the area, and so um, yeah, I'm I'm excited about the the opportunities, the platform that uh, we're going to create to give the kids in our area to uh, to play professionally, and so yeah, I mean the the strategies always will will be, in my opinion, um, to uh, allow the the USL two staff to coach in a system similar to, uh, to, to what we're gonna run at the, at the USL one level, and then to train specifically positional play um, in terms of functions, players to be able to perform those, uh, those roles. And it may mean you know, a handful of players will do multiple, multiple roles as it typically is in, at any level. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I think doing that and also uh, running an academy program where we're training younger kids yeah. to understand um, that, like I said earlier, first and foremost, we're going to make you into a good footballer. Mm-hmm. Uh, have a great understanding of the relationship with the ball, the relationship with the field, the relationship with your teammates, and then we'll address the positional play after that. And why should uh, a young a young player that's coming up in the area? Wh- why should they want to play for the Fuego one day? Um, well, because we are the team of the Central Valley, because we have shown already over a couple of decades that we have the talent locally to be able to prepare kids through this avenue to go even to the next level. We know that we are not the top level in the country. We know that we are one team of many to prepare kids to go to the next level the ultimate level professionally, team-wise, which is MLS. We've done that already um, with a number of players before. Uh, when you look at the, 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 the roster of Fuego players that have gone on to play professionally at MLS and other professional leagues around the world and then the other levels of USL, which we're going to be there ourselves, um, we know that we can do that. And so... Um, they want to be. They want to be a part of this because this is a platform. This is a trampoline, so to speak. You know, as we say uh, sometimes. And so, um, th- th- this is a goal for now for them to make this team. And those that have the the ability to go to the next level, um, they should. As you are aware of uh, of the roster of of players that. Uh, that have gone on. I mean, we have uh, we have roots uh, here in Fresno with uh, guys that have gone on to win the MLS Cup. Mm-hmm. You know, and have pictures with uh, President Bush. You right. know, at the White House, and right. and, the, and then other uh, professional teams in, in MLS and in, in other countries. And so, um, we 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 want the community to be aware of that. And uh, and and I also my, my hope is that we would create a um, uh, a hall. Uh, you know, sure. with, within the, 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 the Fuego installations yep. that the people can come and see all those that have gone before that can be that example to the kids um, mm-hmm. and the professionals, right? Yeah. Not, not just professional footballers, but the professionals in some career sure. path that they, that they chose because let's face it, most of them come through the college ranks mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what it, now, I mean, you're, you've been so accomplished uh, in your career and in your life and, and you've, You've reached these these milestones as a player and a coach, um, and running programs and starting programs. Why why this? What what does this mean to you to to take on this new role with a professional organization? And and what does it what does it really mean to you? Well, it, it just means that the efforts of so many um, has come to fruition. It just means that the the, the dreams of uh, many many children can uh, become a reality uh, as was my dream as a player uh, as a youth playing in the streets of Mexicali and uh, dreaming someday of playing professionally and 
I had no idea what it was going to take. I just loved mm-hmm. the game and, and mm-hmm. thought it was a cool thing to be a professional soccer player. Right. You know, and then coming to the U.S. Uh, and having the opportunity to go to college. And then uh, two opportunities during college uh, time, my sophomore year and my senior year, to be um, offered a, a professional contract to make a play for the North American Soccer League and the American Soccer League uh, back then. And um, th- to, to have lived that dream and to know that through the efforts of many that have collaborated with me since I've been coaching, um, we have the platform now to provide that opportunity for other kids. Um, and, and as we did with Fuego when it was strictly an amateur, an amateur team. So through the combined experience of uh, Fresno Pacific and Fresno State at, at its time, when, when it was there, when we started, Fresno State was uh, on, it, on its way out when, when we started Fuego. Uh, and and, and to, to collaborate uh, to provide that platform for those groups of players you know, and, and even when you look at City College and Clovis Community and, Very successful. you know, we have uh, now one of, one, of, one of our own, Renato Bustamante, mm. uh, um, working at uh, COS now, and he's going to mm. prepare players. And so, so to provide those opportunities to bring those players together uh, for them to, um, to experience that dream, as a handful of them are living it right now, because we know that once, uh, you know, the Foxes closed down, a handful of players went and signed with other players, I mean, other, I mean, other teams. And, and, they're, and they're living that dream. And they grew up playing here. They were developed here by a combination of, uh, of programs, you know, the youth programs, the high school programs, the community college programs, the university programs. And so um, we, we, we want to do that for, uh, for this next generation of players. Yeah, you're a humble guy, you know, and I think a lot of people, a, l- a lot of people love that to you. And I mean, I hope there's many of us that get to gloat about you all the time because I know you won't do it yourself. But uh, I think a lot of people are proud that, that you're in the role that you're in and, and they believe in, in what you've got going. And uh, so what, what one, why do you think this area has been overlooked? And then, and then kind of the last question is, what are some of the goals that you have to accomplish in the first few years of, of the Fuego? Um, frame it to me again. Yeah, um, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, you spoke about your own experience coming up as a local player and you had some opportunities to play professionally. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of folks out there that, that believe that, that our area, the players are overlooked Mm -hmm. and that they aren't recruited at the same level of people in the Bay area or in LA or in Vegas or other big cities. So why do you think that, that some of those players have not been recognized at the same level of, uh, of Mm -hmm. some of the bigger cities? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just think we have to be honest and, and, and truthful, you know, about life, you know, about, about society. I mean, we know that uh, SoCal and NorCal, uh, they, they have those hubs, those areas where, you know, the professional scouts, the division, college division one NCAA programs uh, uh, are looked at, you know, they're, they're, they're there. And so, um, and, and we're, we're the Central Valley, we're an island, we're, we're, we're the farmers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what, whatever they call us, uh, and, and it has to serve as, mo- as motivation. And, and, and I think it would uh, um, it would behoove us to recognize that with what is coming, with uh, the complex, with the professional team, with the stadium, um, with the branding of this organization, uh, with with the name Fuego, there's going to be a sense of pride, and and many many will look into in, in this direction. Uh, for players, as as we know, we've seen, you know, sort of sprinkles of players, you know, mm-hmm. you, know li- you know, come and go, leave, get get identified, get picked. Um, I, I firmly believe that uh, with uh, with the coaching staff and with the number of people that are going to be working with me um, in this in this endeavor, we're going to be able to to become, uh, you know, and 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 I'm, I'm not saying this just to say it. You know, we we, we can be uh, we, we can have our own La Masia here. You know. Uh, a farm okay mm-hmm. a farm to develop players yeah. to, to come out because um, you know, th- there's a lot of uh, models and examples around the world that have done that in communities that uh, you know th- they don't you don't have to be Liverpool you don't have to be you know Barcelona or you don't have to be Real Madrid and in uh, menu you, you can be in an area like this when we're where we're somewhat isolated but we have the resources to prepare kids go to the next level and 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 they will come looking they will come again and, and you know fortunately for me in my years of experience that i've uh, um that i've coached at the college level and in the pdl level um i've got enough contacts around around the country 
to be able to make phone calls, you know, for our players, and and at the very least put them uh, in a camp, mm-hmm. you know, in an MLS camp, and you know, for for uh, not everybody has to get drafted, right? You know, yeah. in, in the MLS Super Draft to you know to make a, an MLS team. You know, n- not everybody has to go to the Olympic Development Program to be mm-hmm. uh, seen and, and selected to to our um, uh, Olympic teams or national teams, youth teams, and then and our senior teams. You know. Um, case in point, the the kid right now that's on the on the senior team, Julian Araujo, um, out of uh, Lompoc, you know, he he wasn't uh, all that three four years ago, and then all of a sudden he gets discovered at a, at his club level in Santa Barbara, and then he gets uh, a scholarship to go to to the Barcelona Academy in Casa Grande, and wow. then he's on the se- U seventeen national team, U twenty national team, drafted by the ILA Galaxy, and he's on our senior roster now, mm. and so. Th- those things can happen more more often than uh, than hadn't been happening in the past. Yeah, I think that's going to be happening, and I know that we have a um, culture of kids here in the Central Valley that can do the same. Yeah, perfect. And la- last question I have for you is just in your in your first couple of years, uh, you know, directing the technical side of this club. What what are some of the goals that you have and and things that you want to have the club accomplish? Well, I, I think when it comes to competition, because we're going to be competing for for titles, you know, at this um, uh, at this level, is, is to prepare a staff that it's going to um, recruit and select um, a roster of players that are going to give us the, a chance uh, to compete for a for a national title. And and, w- and when I say a national title, I'm not skipping anything. I just want to be clear because it's the same question that that has been asked of me as an intercollegiate player. Uh, it's not easy to get to a national title. Um, you have to start at the conference level, right? You have to take care of your conference. Right. And so you have to understand your opponents. You, know, you have to understand what you have to do to compete at that level in order to win that okay, and not look past anybody. You know, respect your opponents. I think that's one of the, the things that I've appreciated about my experience as a collegiate coach. I respect my opponents. I have a great relationship with my uh, my coaches uh, or, or opposing coaches were good friends we're colleagues okay? mm-hmm. we're not enemies mm-hmm. we're colleagues but we compete right you know and, and sometimes it's, you, you cross lines you know in terms of competition when it, when when the games get heated and get they get excited but we know that at the end of the day you know we're we're colleagues and, and we're trying to do the same thing and so we want we want to send a message to our players that this is going to be a championship organization okay and, and they will get, we're, we're going to prepare to be champions and and in doing that we're going to open doors for them to go to other places yeah very good well this is the first of many i hope to have you on all the time i mean i know that that the fuego family and the community want to hear what's going on uh with the team and what what your plans are so we're going to do this a lot more often but thank you so much for being on this this is the third episode of el show and uh with that any any last parting words no, just just excited, really, really excited. You know, my family, you know, my family and I, you know, my wife, Laura Beth, I mean, she is uh, 100% behind this and uh, knows that, you know, she's, she's seen so much of uh, uh, actually all of my journey of the things, the different things that we've done at the various levels, youth, college, high school, and, and Fuego, and then now have to have the opportunity to have this experience. And again, a huge debt of gratitude to the Rellos family. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, thank you. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Thank you.